welcome everybody and thank you for tuning in to this month's webinar for busy lawyers where in just 20 to 30 minutes we deliver practical tips by our fabulous speakers and these are things that you can put into action right away so today i have the absolute pleasure of introducing matthew yospin and Matt is a true friend of Mass Low Map. He is, he's never said no to anything we've ever asked. And his um, presentations are fabulous. So you are really in for um, a treat today. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about Matt before I turn this over to him. Um, Matt helps businesses and entrepreneurs and inventors protect their innovations and build their brands. He's a patent and trademark lawyer who represents clients in a wide range of industries, and he has an incredibly impressive bio. I wish I could go through everything, but I'm just gonna highlight a few of his myriad accomplishments. So uh, Matt served as the co-chair of the Boston Bar Association's solo and small firm section from 2015 to 2017, and he continues on the steering committee. He's, a, uh, he's been recognized as a rising star by Super Lawyer in Massachusetts in 2016, 2017, and this year, 2018. Matt has done pro bono legal work for veterans through the Veterans Legal Services and for arts nonprofits through the Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. He's on the board of directors of Understanding Our Differences, a nonprofit that creates curricula and helps volunteers organize programs at elementary schools to foster understanding of and respect for human differences. Matthew began his legal career at Bingham McCutcheon after interning at the Massachusetts Appeals Court and volunteering at the Supreme Court of the Navajo Nation. Before practicing law, Matthew founded and ran a computer software consulting business. Matt speaks Spanish, German, and French, and enjoys coaching his kids' soccer teams, playing tennis, and ultimate frisbee, building furniture, coding, and gardening. Before I turn it over to Matt, I wanna let you know that we will have time at the end of this program to answer all of your questions. And the way that we can do that really effectively is if you just put them into the chat box, um, which you should hopefully see, but I will write a little chat in there for you just in case you don't see it. And if you write your questions right in there, I'm gonna to get to them at the end, relay them to Matt, and Matt will answer them all for you. So, without further ado, Matt, take it away. All right, well, thank you so much, Susan. I'm really appreciative of the opportunity to speak to folks here today and of everything LOMAP does uh, for attorneys around Massachusetts and elsewhere around the country as well through these webinars and other forums. Um, so right into it. Today we'll be talking about electronic payments for attorneys. Uh, if, by the way, anybody can't hear me well, please uh, speak up, put it in the chat box, let me know. So first things first. Um, when you're considering or are already accepting electronic payments, um, let's run through what we mean by that what the business case is, and then we'll talk about the ethical obligations, uh, about fees, um, about security, and how various payment methods work. Uh, I'll walk you through a little bit of data on attorneys accepting electronic payments, because as anyone who's spoken to me for more than three minutes probably already knows, I really like data. And then uh, briefly, we'll talk about how to use electronic payments and how to choose what uh, format or formats you want to accept them in. Definitions. For our purposes, we're going to talk about credit cards, ACH transactions, that's automated clearinghouse transactions, wire transfers, and peer-to-peer -peer payment methods. Uh, we're not going to talk about cryptocurrency because that is really a large and different ball of wax. And we're also not going to count things like checks, money orders, or barter, or cash because they're not really electronic payments. Charging right ahead. The business case, why accept them? Well, based on personal experience in practice and conversations with other attorneys, 
I think a major reason to accept them is that clients and potential clients ask you to accept them. Um, I've done some limited polling, some largely unscientific polling, and nearly everybody that I've spoken with about it has been asked whether they take them or not. Clients and prospective clients have asked if they take electronic payments. Usually people mean credit cards, but sometimes clients ask for wire transfers or ACH transactions. Other business reasons for it, you can get paid a lot faster if you take credit cards and you can do it without needing to wait for something to come in the mail, without needing to mail things to your client. Um, some people perhaps want self-addressed stamped envelopes. You don't need to do that. You can just invoice them with whatever electronic format you're using and they can pay you. And you can have the money available to you same day or depending on the method within two or three business days for some of them. That's a lot faster than waiting for your client to write a check, to put it in the mail, for it to arrive, for you to deposit it, and for the money to clear to your account. With some of these, you can also be paid before you start working. If you're working on a fixed fee basis, you can take the payment via one of the electronic means and have the money in your account before you start working. As someone who runs a business, I think uh, you'll agree that's a really nice thing. It also can save you a tremendous amount of time and money. You, if you get paid in advance, you don't have to remind your clients to pay you. And even if you don't and you bill them after the fact, it can be much easier for people to pay you. And if they don't have to go through the hassle, as many folks see it now, of finding a checkbook and a pen that works and putting a check in the mail to you, they might just pay you right away from, your, from their phone, from their tablet, from their computer. And lastly, you can end your role as payment plan manager, whether you do it yourself or outsource it or have an admin at your law practice do it. If you don't have to do that and people just pay you when you ask them to pay you, you'll save yourself a lot of time and you can focus that time on other things like actually doing legal work or marketing or spending time outside of the office. Onwards. I think one of the largest stumbling blocks for folks when they think about taking payment via electronic means, credit card, ACH, wires, are the ethical obligations. And you have to consider it because first, all payments can be subject to chargeback and or to a client requesting the money back. With some transfers means like wire transfers, that's harder for the client to request undo. With credit cards, it's very easy for a client to call up their credit card company and say, hey, I didn't authorize this payment, or this person didn't do what they said they were going to do. Now, let's assume that you did, because if you didn't, you are in the wrong and you need to give the money back. But if you did, it still can be a hassle for you. And you have to make sure that you've handled the client funds, whether you've already earned them or not, properly and that you handle a potential chargeback properly. So let's break it into two cases. One, you've earned the money, either a fixed fee that's payable in advance where the money's yours once the client agrees to it and pays it. Or on the other hand, uh, a retainer that should go into either your IOLTA or a segregated account for that particular client. Where you've already earned the money, you already have it. It's going to be in your operating account or taken out and you've, you know, use it to pay an expense, say. But when a chargeback comes, you have to address it. And that probably means responding to the client's credit card company with proof that you've done the work, such as the engagement agreement that you have in writing with them, right? Because you do have that in writing with them. And second, uh, an itemized invoice showing what you've done for the project and therefore that one, you've done the work and two, the fee was reasonable. And 
assuming you can provide those two things to the client's credit card company, you should be able to prevail in the dispute over the chargeback. It is going to be a hassle for you. It's probably going to take up several hours of your time and it's going to take, you know, a week, a few weeks, and you will not enjoy the process. Uh, it will probably be an unpleasant hassle, but you can prevail. If the client paid you with a wire transfer or an ACH transaction, it's harder for them to undo. Uh, I'm not certain that they have easy recourse to hit you with a chargeback in the way that they can if they paid with a credit card. Or, uh, and also with a peer-to-peer -peer transaction, I don't think they can go after you in the same way as they can with a credit card. To some degree, the issue of chargebacks uh, advocates against attorneys accepting credit cards and in favor of other electronic means of payment because the credit cards can be a hassle for the attorneys. But that's one of the reasons that people like to pay with them so much. I think if you consider your own purchasing decisions and you're like most Americans, you probably pay for many, many things with credit cards. One of the reasons is it's so convenient. And if the seller doesn't deliver the goods or the services, you can call your credit card company and complain, and clients like that protection when they deal with us as attorneys too. Just something you should keep in mind. Now, in the other case where you're being paid in advance of doing the work and you haven't earned the money yet, it needs to be in an IOLTA. Um, in Massachusetts, it's rule 1.15B. In most jurisdictions, it's the same rule because these are based on the model rules. But if you're not in Massachusetts, check your jurisdiction, read the rules, familiarize yourself with them. That rule is on the segregation of trust property. And that's money that you haven't earned, that's in a retainer for work that's planned uh, and it's there so that you have some security that the client can't walk away and pay you nothing. But when you are taking a payment via electronic means for a retainer, you have to put the full amount into the IOLTA. And it's supposed to go in there directly and not go through an intermediary account. And with a wire transfer or an ACH transaction that gets deposited directly into your IOLTA, that's possible, provided that you've got a processor, your bank, who takes the fee, if there is a fee on your end, out of your operating account or some other account and not out of the funds that the client transfers from the client's account into your IOLTA because you have to fund the full amount. Say they pay you a $5,000 retainer. If the wire transfer fee is $50, all 5,000 has to go into the IOLTA and it's supposed to go directly in there, not through an operating account. And if your bank wants to charge you $50, they have to do it and you have to set it up so that it comes out of an account other than your IOLTA. If your bank doesn't charge you a wire transfer fee or, or anything, then great. They may charge the client. The client has to know that, and I think you should take the time to, dis to mention this to the client if they're going to pay into an IOLTA via a wire transfer or an ACH, that if their bank charges them out of the fee, then that's not part of their retainer. That's not part of their funds. They probably won't like that, but you need to discuss it with them, I think. If the client is paying you with a credit card and wants it to be a retainer payment into their IOLTA or an account just for that client, it is more challenging because credit card companies charge a processing fee and they charge it to the person or entity receiving the funds. And that's you. So if you take money for a retainer via a credit card payment, there's, there's two problems. One is the fee that's going to come out of it. And the other is what account it goes into. Because typically, a credit card processor will put the money into an account other than your IOLTA, into an operating account. And you need to structure it so that it goes to the IOLTA directly. Not all credit card processors can do that. There are a few that are focused on attorneys, and they will 
structure that for you for a monthly charge. And you also need to be sure that the fee is coming out of your operating account. Now, sometimes folks ask if you can pass credit card fees on to clients. Uh, I'm only speaking about Massachusetts here. I'm not familiar with rules in other jurisdictions. I don't think that there's a clear answer with regard to attorneys, but in general, merchants, that's anyone who's selling a product or a service, can pass a credit card fee on to the purchaser. So you can do it, provided that you give them notice about it and tell them that you know, the fee is gonna be charged to you separately and either say out of the $4,000 that you're being charged, not all of it is gonna to go towards your bill, or I'm gonna charge you more to cover the fee or charge you a convenience fee. You can, I believe, do all of those things under the ethical rules and laws of Massachusetts regarding credit cards and merchants in general, not specific to attorneys, provided that you tell the client that. And of course you should do that in writing. But personally, I suggest that you not do that because that feels weird. Very few other merchants do that, other than perhaps gas stations that charge separate prices for cash and credit, which as someone who buys gasoline occasionally, I think most of you will agree, is annoying. Um, the gas station model uh, in response seems to be, well, we're just gonna charge more for cash uh, once they'd raise their prices to cover the 2.95 or so percent charge that they had added to their base price, the cash price, for credit card payments. Well, I think if you walk into any store, most merchants will be happy if you pay cash because then they don't have to eat the credit card fee, but it's not worth it to them for your, your meal or your you know, new pair of shoes to say, okay, you know, thanks for paying, and also I'm gonna charge you an extra 3% because you used a credit card. And personally, I don't think attorneys should do that either. I think it's an awkward conversation to have with a client. I think it's an unnecessary conversation to have with a client. And if you are using credit cards, perhaps the next time you raise your rates, you add, say, 2.5 or 2.95% to whatever you would have raised them by to cover the credit card fees. And then you just charge that rate. Lastly, confidentiality as an ethical obligation when you're accepting electronic payments. You have to be uh, aware of the need to protect client confidentiality. And one way that you, one thing you need to be aware of is when you are invoicing someone, say with an online uh, invoice that, send, that they can pay by credit card, or with anything else that you use through uh, a payment processor, don't put confidential information in there. Don't, uh, for instance, share your itemized invoice through the credit card processor that contains a list of what you've done for them and when. Don't say this is for you know X lawsuit or you know Y contested matter or this uh, merger that we're working on. I think instead to protect confidentiality, whatever payment system you're using, you should just say for you know work that I've done or for services rendered, please see our recent emails or our recent invoice for details of it. So that the only thing that the credit card processor has that could be hacked from them or that they could inadvertently share with somebody else or that could be intercepted in the electronic communication of the payment request is the person it went to and services, services rendered. Uh, next slide. Okay, fees, what does it cost? Um, ACH transactions, uh, automated clearinghouse transactions, they can vary, you just have to ask your bank. And you can be charged for receiving uh, as well as sending them, some banks do. Wire transfers, same thing. Wire transfers tend to cost more, but they're faster. Uh, I'm, I'm not a banker. I don't, I don't play a banker on television, so I'm not gonna go into great detail on the difference between ACH transactions and wires. I will just say that ACH is something where a bank or banks bundle up their transactions and they get processed 
generally every night. They take a couple of days to clear. Uh, the fees tend to be less. They might be zero. They probably aren't. Wires happen uh, in near real time. They require actual communication between two banks or uh, or banking institutions. Um, for instance, uh, Wells Fargo or Western Union. You might have a client who can they show up with cash and send you a wire or receive a wire through it without having a bank account. The fees tend to be higher and it's faster. Credit card processing. There is a huge range. Um, typically 1.5% to 3% or for some 2.95. How much will it be and how will you know? You have to read the fine print. And I will just say this, that many credit card processors like to advertise really low rates of 1.5% or 1.8%, somewhere in that range, below 2%. But those in in the research I've done, those are almost entirely for what are considered non-rewards cards or non-specialty cards. Now, if you don't know what a rewards card is or what a specialty card is, the easy answer is take out your wallet and look at the credit cards in your wallet. Those are rewards cards because very few people bother to get non-rewards cards because rewards cards are the ones that give you frequent flyer miles or cash back or you know, bonuses or points, whatever the different credit card merchant calls it, rewards cards give you something back. And nearly every consumer uses those because why wouldn't you? You get something back. You're, you're buying whatever it is you need to buy and you get roughly half or 1% of the value of it back. Nearly everybody has them and nearly everybody is going to use a rewards card to pay you because why wouldn't they want to get 1% back on your very reasonable bill for legal services? Well, they do. And so the fee that you're going to get charged is the 2.9 or 2.95 or 3% plus 20 or 30 cents per transaction. So read the fine print when you're signing up with or researching credit card processors so that you're not surprised by what they're charging you. Uh, in my personal experience, some of them have really complicated statements, and they might be in really, really small letters. So good luck reading them. Uh, and also be aware that some of them, especially the ones that focus on attorneys and have the uh, sort of segregated setup where you can have funds go into your operating account or into your IOLTA with the fee taken out of your operating account, will often charge you a monthly fee as well, 10, 15, or $20. Uh, maybe your bar association has negotiated a better deal with them, but even so, you're gonna pay that fee every month whether you use their service to process a credit card transaction or not. Be aware, it might be worth it. The time it saves you and the hassle it saves you could be worth it, but be aware of what you're signing up for. Uh, lastly, peer-to-peer -peer payments. Uh, these are things like Venmo, um, PayPal, and some banks will let you send money directly to people who don't even have an account at that bank uh, using an email address or a mobile phone number for the recipient of the funds. Some of those uh, work well for attorneys. Some of them have restrictions on commercial use. And you receiving payments is, I think, commercial use. So you probably shouldn't use some of them. You need to research the terms and services uh, sorry, terms and conditions of service of each potential peer-to-peer -peer payment processor like Venmo before you use them. Uh, your clients might ask, uh, be cautious before you say, yes, of course. Um, lastly, security and how they work. Well, here are some credit card processors. Uh, LawPay and LexCharge are two that I know of that focus on attorneys as well as others. Of course, there are more. This is not an exhaustive list. Other processors that I know attorneys uh, have used are PayPal, Square, uh, some have used Apple Pay, uh, and some practice management platforms or accounting platforms, uh, such as QuickBooks, I think Rocket Matter, maybe Clio, my case, others may have credit card processing built in. Uh, you need to be uh, first mindful of the confidentiality obligations, but also um, mindful of uh, I'm blanking on the term for it right now. The uh, 
card processor security requirements. If you keep a credit card of a client, you have to comply with the card handling requirements that your processing institution requires of you. So if you keep the credit card in an unencrypted form, you can be on the hook if that is uh, stolen from you, either electronically or in paper. And some of the payment processors will let you store it and associate it with the client, but where you don't have access to the card information. And I know some attorneys who use that so that when there's a bill to the client, they send the client a bill and say, I'm going to you know, charge your credit card, and provided, of course, the client agreed to that in writing in the engagement agreement in advance. And that, I think, is allowable under the ethical rules. But if you just keep the card information yourself, one, you're creating a tremendous security risk and liability risk for yourself. And two, you can't just charge ahead, uh, sorry, you can't just forge ahead and charge the client's card when you invoice them, you need their consent. So maybe you got it in writing, and the only thing that you need to be concerned about is the tremendous security risk. But uh, if you don't have that in writing, uh, you're, <laughs> you're in violation of card handling rules, and I think ethical rules as well. Uh, with ACH and wire transfers, I think there's much less risk because you don't get the client's uh, account information, nothing that's not uh, publicly available. Um, for instance, if someone pays you with a check, you get their bank routing number and you get their account number, their checking account number, because it's on the physical check. Uh, when someone pays you with an ACH or a wire, you get the same information. There's no uh, additional security risk to you in having that information that I'm aware of. Finally, peer-to-peer -peer payments, I think there's much less security risk. You don't get access to the client's account info, you don't get their account info, you're not holding a card number that you can use to authorize a payment to their card, you know, a charge to their card that would pay you. Uh, but again, you gotta check the ethical rules and make sure you're allowed to accept those types of payments. Uh, I did an unscientific, I conducted a very unscientific survey and uh, the sample size here is 16, I got 16 attorneys to answer. Um, close to half of them uh, said that they take credit cards and wire transfers, and slightly fewer said they take ACH transactions. Uh, I believe one of the 16 said that they take person-to-person -person transfers, and several people said that it uh, doesn't apply to them. Some of those who take electronic payments take, apparently, credit cards and wires and ACH transactions. Some people don't take them at all. Peer-to-peer. Uh, -peer, Payments really are uncommon. Um, clients, I think, tend not to ask as much. Um, you can perhaps speculate on the demographics of clients who ask. It's probably younger clients, but without hard data, uh, it's, it's hard to know. And I also asked in the survey, uh, was several questions, if people thought they'd lost a client because they didn't take electronic payments. I believe only one person answered yes to that out of the 16 who answered. And that means that there's six or so out of the 16 who answered who don't take payments and didn't think they'd lost the client. I think the moral there is clients ask, and if you say no, most of them will say, okay, well, I'll send you a check or some other form. Um, you can see the survey results in that uh, link shortened there. Um, I'll put it back up in a minute if you haven't already gotten a chance to get it. I won't read it off. Um, finally, and I, I know we're at 1230, how to, which should you use? Well, if you're using a law practice management platform that already allows for electronic payments inside in some format, that's probably the best solution because it's right there and it's already set up. Likewise, if you're using an accounting platform, uh, QuickBooks, I believe, not that this is an endorsement, uh, allows those charges. Um, some of these platforms may allow you to store the client, you know, have the client enter their credit card info so that you don't know it, but your law practice platform or your accounting platform does. And when you invoice them, it can be charged against their card without them having to go in and 
you know, click on an electronic invoice and pay you. Law Pay and Lex Charge, as well as PayPal and I believe Square will let you send people an invoice electronically, you know, as a link to a secure web page where they can enter their card, credit card info and pay you. Uh, some banks will allow that as well, but it's probably going to be more hassle for you to work directly with your bank and negotiate with them than it is for you to simply use one of the credit card processors or, again, if it's built into a platform you're already using. Uh, lastly, something like peer-to-peer -peer payments as an ad hoc payment system. Again, if a client asks and if you think it's allowed within the ethical rules, uh, they're fast, they're easy, uh, they tend not to take a processing fee out, and you know if you're always paying 3% of 5000 and $8,000 payments, maybe you'd like to not pay that for some of them. But again, make sure that it is allowed under the ethical rules in your jurisdiction. Uh, if anybody has questions, uh, I hope we have some minutes for it now, Susan. Uh, and of course, here's my contact info. Uh, feel free to contact me over the phone or email or find me on Twitter, wherever. I'm on a lot of social media platforms and I'll be happy to field them there. And thank you very much. Matt, thank you so much. This was fantastic. It was so informative. And we do have time for questions. Thank you, Susan. We already have several questions for you. All uh, right. So uh, let's get started with questions. Okay. Um, you had mentioned early on a uh, fixed fee, and we have one um, attendee asking if you mean that in the same sense as flat fee. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, we also have a question about whether you have any advice on completing the security verifications that processors require to avoid a monthly fee. <laughs> um, yes, my advice is pay attention to their emails, do it as soon as you can, because based on conversations I've had with people, those processors will be very happy to charge you a monthly surcharge if you haven't completed the security verification. And uh, because I'm a lawyer, I'm also gonna add this is not legal advice and I'm not representing you and giving you this suggestion. Friendly talking it through. Gotcha. Yep. Um, RSD wanted to let us know that um, according to Terry Pritzker of the BBO, lawyers can keep their own funds in an IOLTA account for administrative fees, um, but the maximum amp amount that they can keep there is $300, and they could use that to pay processing fees. I, oh. I can't tell you if this is, I don't know. I didn't check this out, but RSD, and I don't know who RSD is, um, just posted that to everybody. That is great to know. I, I did not know that. Um, thank you, RSD, for bringing that up. Uh, I'd love to find the BBO's opinion on that if they have one. Um, I've, I've read several of their opinions, as well as a DC bar opinion on taking credit cards. Uh, California bar opinion and ABA opinion. Um, the, the tricky part is that $300 is a little low. Um, if, you're, if you're processing $10,000 or so a month in credit card payments from, you know, from one client, from different clients, and the processing fee that you're paying is 2.9 or so percent, you're going to hit that 300 most months. And you would, I think, have to stay on top of it. Uh, it would add to your IOLTA uh, bookkeeping, whether you do it yourself or outsource it. And you'd have to replenish it pretty regularly. You know, again, if you're doing more than, or, or anywhere close to probably 10,000 or so a month in credit card payments or any electronic payment that would debit a fee from your IOLTA. Um, one other, consideration is that as as i understand it according to the bbo when someone pays you for a retainer it's supposed to go directly into the retainer so somebody pays you with a check or cash okay that's easy take it to the bank deposit it put it right into the retainer but if you're taking it via a credit card many credit card processors won't deposit it directly into the retainer. 
They might put it into your account with the processor, like PayPal does. They might put it into your operating account, and it might take a couple of days to get there. And I don't think it's been tested, but my reading of the BBO's opinions is that that's not good enough, and and they don't think it's good enough. So having the, you know a three hundred dollar cushion to pay fees out of your IOLTA, you know, from a fee debited to your IOLTA, is great, but I'm not sure that it gets you across either of the first couple of hurdles. Oh, and sorry, Susan, one other point about IOLTAs and credit cards. If you get a chargeback, if that is if a client contests a credit card payment that was made to your IOLTA, and let's say you complied with the rules and you used LaPay or LexCharge or somebody that put it directly into your IOLTA, not into an inter intermediary account, and didn't take a fee out of your IOLTA, that chargeback will go to your IOLTA. And the if you don't prevail, the client's credit card processor will try to pull it out of your IOLTA. And good luck to you if that happens. Really good points, Matt, thank you. We have another question. Um, if the client initiates a chargeback even if the attorney is successful defending it with the credit card company, doesn't the attorney have to then put those funds back into the IOLTA until the dispute is resolved? Yes, you do. Yeah, if you'd already withdrawn them from the IOLTA, like, you know, you, you did the work, you invoiced them, you said, I'm gonna take it out of your IOLTA in five days, you take it out of their IOLTA in five days, and it's in your operating account, or you spent, that particular chunk of money. If the client uh, initiates the chargeback, and I believe there's a within a reasonable uh, period of time, both for chargebacks and for other disputes about attorney's fees, um, who knows what reasonable is? 30 days, 90 days? You know, say they wait six months, maybe you can just say, uh, you waited too long, but uh, do you want to? It seems like a risky uh, response. But say they initiate the chargeback 10 days after you'd taken it out of the IOLTA, yes, I believe you have to put that money back into the IOLTA and redo your IOLTA bookkeeping so that it says, okay, you know, in your um, chronological list, uh, you put it back in and in your client by client list, it's back in, in their name. And for the duration of the chargeback dispute, which, you know, can easily be a month or more, that money's got to stay there. And if you'd already spent it, come up with it somewhere else and put it back into the IOLTA. Great, Great question. Uh, well, I don't see any more questions. Um, so thank you again, Matt. This was really fantastic, so helpful. I wanna let everybody know that we will be putting up a recording from today's presentation as well as Matt's slides. Uh, it will probably not go up until next week because our marketing director who does this is on vacation this week, so be a little patient with us. Um, and you will, you'll be able to access it. So I just wanna thank everybody for tuning in and tell you guys, mark your calendars for next month's webinar when Ginny Allen will present the ethics of intake, how to successfully set up your intake process while remaining in compliance with ethical rules. This will be on October 17th at noon. Um, that's all we have. Thank you so much, everybody, and have a terrific afternoon. Wonderful. Thanks, Susan. Thank you, Matt.